All right, all right. Jerry, nice to see you, bud. Hey, how are you? I'm really good, thank you. I'm really good. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation. I'd say to those who are joining us live, welcome to episode 10, I think, of the Buyer's World LinkedIn Live. So I started this LinkedIn Live because I think there's a ton of events out there, you know, sales skills and all these tactical things, but I really wanted us to collectively improve our understanding of a typical buyer journey. It's one of the things that remain constant. Buyers' brains don't really change. So really understanding more about the decisions that they need to make to start working with us and how we can help to facilitate and support them. And for those of you who have just started following me or are like, I don't even know why I'm here. I'm Hannah Ajikawo. I am the CEO and founder of Revenue Funnel, a go-to-market consulting firm to do simply two things, help companies to convert more opportunities and do that at higher deal values. And I get the fortune of connecting with people like Jerry, global revenue leaders to uh, share their perspectives, popular and unpopular regarding how we can get better at improving the dynamics between sales, sellers and buyers. All right, we're in. Okay, was that one minute? We're doing good, we're doing good. All right, Jerry, uh, thank you. Thanks for being here. My pleasure, pleasure. Gives me an opportunity to waffle on about something I care about, so. Yeah, but two waffles. It's going to be, it, it, we're, we're going to go over. So we're going to try our best to keep it inside it. So just let everybody know who you are and, and, and what you're doing at the moment. Yes, I'm general manager and regional vice president for a tech company called Connect and Sell. We think we've cracked the code on cold call inefficiency and cold call execution. Um, turnkey transformation proposition, which enables reps to have a conversation every four minutes when they cold call today, as opposed to having a conversation every 90 minutes. And I think that's probably why you think I'm qualified to talk about relevance as a value driver, not personalization as a value driver, right? Exactly, exactly. We're talking about, so we'll be, I mean, we can sp speak about all areas of the, uh, the revenue funnel, what we like to focus yeah. on. Today, I think we're going to talk about, I say top of funnel, right? So when we hear cold calling, we usually associate that with, with the top of funnel or those early interactions. Yeah. Now, you just said connect with someone every four minutes. Yeah. Like that's. Uh, to, to most people that's like that's impossible like I, I know that I make 60 70 80 calls a day I, I get one person what what's di what's different for, for how you guys are approaching that well, I think it's the mechanics right there's physics involved and physics generally has to bypass a lot of waste and frustration for a flow rate to start making sense mm -hmm. the flow rate for most reps today is buy a list from zoom info call the list but actually behind the list what are the first principles that are preventing you from getting into a conversation at a one to four percent connect rate it's not your effort it's not the quality of the data that you've bought it's just this pesky little thing called is my prospect available when i want them to be yep and the reason that we find that really difficult to time for is because each and every single dial that we make manually or through click to dial or as part of our outreach sequence has got no understanding of the physics of what happens between a dial and a conversation and that's generally mm -hmm. a bucket load of voicemail an exorbitant amount of managing phone trees, IVRs, dial by name directories, dealing with people picking up the phone who aren't the intended recipient. So our proposition centers on the idea that we can use technology to do good tech stuff, volume, velocity, integrate CRMs and sales engagement tools, connect into telephony, control phone number banks, and do all the sort of operational lift. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you just rely on technology to get around all of those invisible forces, you're only ever going to be able to actively speak to about 10 to 15% of your market. So actually what we've got is this human labor pool that sits inside our tech and they essentially take on dials, manage dials, execute dials all the way through till the end point. If Hannah's in my list, she picks up, hey, Hannah here. That navigation agent in my system simply transfers it to Jerry through the tech. The software alerts my headset, gives me a screen pop. I'm in, I'm in a real life conversation with Hannah immediately. And then I just simply rinse and repeat that process. So by forcing velocity and volume, and then having this masterful expert ninja force of humans dealing with each and every single dial on its own merits without having to have my expensive UK or USA or European based rep manage that work, I'm immediately creating supreme top line and bottom line efficiency. My dials and conversations and meetings become a hell of a lot cheaper because I haven't consumed an entire day's worth of labor to get to the conversation. I've assumed 85% of that inefficiency now being 85% efficient. And then I'm giving an opportunity for my reps to just become supremely competent at calls because guess what? They're having a lot more of them in a conscious, conscious way. 
like these are people that are confirming their name when they pick up the phone. This is the research and intended prospect, and I better be able to execute well on that basis. I'm not wasting any of the <laughs> trash that comes along with cold calling as a result. I, I need to. So everyone, okay. okay so welcome to Mars. This is Jerry <laughs> Grimes Hill, okay, the master rhymes of cold calling. Now I, we need to strip this all back because yeah. we are at a time where if you are a rep, your leaders like. Why aren't you making enough calls? How come you're not connecting with enough people? Why is the pipeline low? I'm looking into Q1, I'm not seeing much. I'm looking into Q4, we're not really hearing back from our prospects. What's happening? And then we hear things like 85% efficient rather than 85% inefficient. And then we've got our the, the board, right? You're at a startup and you're like learning all this new language about CAP and, and LTV yeah. and all these new phrases. And then as a rep, you're like, what more do you want from me? And you're hearing operational efficiency. You've seen half your mm. colleagues have to be wiped out of the organization because the, the business is not structured now with lots and lots of cash to keep burning, right? So we have to get better at what we're doing. So we're looking at top of funnel and we're looking at how we try to do what everyone's been saying, personalization, personalization, and also achieve all these things. So, okay, Jerry just covered a lot. So Jerry, I want to I wanna go right back to... Yeah. To, to the to the topic right so we've got prioritizing relevance in giving personalization a backseat so you might have seen a few people in the comments saying both things are critical before the event started both things are critical to uh to to, to the sales role today they're all relevant etc now i'm gonna go back to 2015 some of you may have been in school i was well into my sales <laughs> career right and i was selling what you know conversion rate optimization software and personalization stuff and and it was really at a time in fact 2013 it was 2013 i started selling this it was at a time when companies started building um martech solutions and embedding personalization so they were going heavy on recommendation engines weren't really leveraging ai but that became the norm right so asos going to send me an email asos yeah. was a big sender back then sending me an email lots of nike trainers because guess what i always spend money on nike you know lots of men's yeah. chinos always wear men's chinos right i'm like wow they know me so well so we we became used to that and then you know about seven ish years later in b uh, in b2b we said we should really be personalizing everything but then people said yeah. but it's taken me ages i can't figure out where jerry went to school i don't know what his kid's name is like how am i going to personalize so let's talk about that for a sec mm. well here's the thing with asos they don't know where you went to school or what your kid's name is they've just got a dashboard and a algorithm working in the background that can identify what you like as a consumer what your preferences are b2b we don't have enough opt-in data to be able to make that personalization relevant but we're trying to hunt for it all the time and then the lazy component of personalization which has corrupted a lot of outbound and outbound quality today is open parentheses find fields that i can extract from my operational engine either my sales loft my outreach my sales force my hubspot and just drop in these keywords that I can extract from data sets. And that's not personal. In fact, it's a little bit creepy. And I find that I would personally <laughs> cringe 900% of the time if anybody referenced the fact that they went to the University of Wales Aberystwyth, because it would make them acutely weird for that choice, first off. But secondly, it's just not personal. It's trying to create false rapport with somebody mm. and there are very few people that can make it inherently humorous or packed full of pathos or packed full of empathy because it requires you to be a world-class writer and i'd say that only five percent of the world's population are world-class writers and only about one percent of the five percent end up in a sales career especially mm. in an early development sales development market development account development kind of sales career so the writing that goes around that personalization is generally very weak and hard to contextualize. In fact, I say to two of my reps all the time, the one thing that I'm always looking to improve from you is your quality of writing. It's not very good. Mm -hmm. People don't write specifically well. So when you try and personalize with asynchronous content in the form of email, LinkedIn messaging, text, SMS, or WhatsApp, tone is inherently lacking which is one of the reasons why i think personalization fails i always sort of just put it to the bar test maybe i'm showing my age a little bit but if i express an interest in somebody and i want to go and talk to them at a bar 
I'm not going in loaded with knowledge. I'm going in loaded with curiosity. Mm. Like, I don't want them to know that I know everything about them. Imagine if I went up to you at the bar and I was like, hey, Anna, saw that you're this X, Y, Z and you've done X, Y, Z and done ABC and you're awesome at this. I just want to say I'm a real fan. That's not establishing credible relationship. <laughs> All right, it's it's just like, yeah, somebody call the police and put, 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 inform a protective cordon around me while I order my drink, please. And I'll try I, and just sort of be nice to this person to get rid of them. I like that. Or I could that. just say, yeah, like, you know what, Hannah? I find yeah, I, you a really, really interesting human. Yeah. I'm here to see what I can learn from you. No threat, no harm, no foul. Just, I just think mm. you're interesting. What can I learn? I know which is more appealing to general psychology and laws of attraction, and it's it's being curious. And then I think relevance is the one thing that law of attraction really deploys in B to B rather than B to C, because it's not about egos in quite the same way. You know, I love it if somebody predicts what I'm about to wear. I love that. It's the right sign. Send it to me. Send it to the basket. I'll buy it. Because you're solving a laziness problem against them <laughs> more than anything, rather than a personal problem. I don't yeah. care if it's ASOS; it could be any one of the four or five places where I buy my clothes from. I'm not, I'm not loyal. I just like the convenience. Mm -hmm. In B2B, I think what we need to do is deploy our value proposition so that they center around what people actually care about when they go to work. What do they care about? They don't want to leak economic value from their job. They don't want to feel frustrated in and around how they do their core job. And lastly, they want to be able to go home and see their families or go and spend time with their mates. They don't want to live to work. So if you can deploy messaging, which is relevant to one of those three streams and center mm -hmm. your proposition against that and center you, the originator of that message is the expert, that degree of relevance, social proof and care comes through until you get to a point in that relationship that you're just starting with somebody that you can now be personal. And I think personalization is something that comes down the funnel three to four steps later when you can start to have shared enough about each other that you feel comfortable asking questions that are potentially non-professional that deepen the relationship. So I, I, I think that's about, my personal belief. No, um, listen, it's, it's about pers it's about personal beliefs today, right? So yeah. I can just see someone, someone's just clipped that. They've just done a screen recording and they're sending it to their manager saying, I, I told you. <laughs> it's so hard but so so i'm a big fan on making sure everybody's on the same page so i like to ground everyone in 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 a in a single understanding so we really do actually understand the difference between personalization and relevance right so typically when we're talking about personalization it's something that is um linked directly to that individual right so and that's why we we typically struggle to and we spend time racking our brains when we're trying to look at these profiles. And it just says that they, the, the most we can come up with is, hey, Jerry, I can see that you're a partner manager or a sales manager. And people are like, OK, <laughs> this is, I, yeah, that's clear. Tick. Right. Whereas relevance is something that is is more like just it, it's more like yeah. it's connected and appropriate. Right. So it's connected I, and appropriate. Yeah, that, that's a really good definition. Right rather than it being something that's just like really individualized to say like know that you are this age and you're married and you have a son and you went to work you're like that, that stuff then trying to weave it into it and be like a, a magician in how you weave words together and be yeah. a storyteller is very hard to do when you've got you know a thousand prospects in your in your territory but, but also yeah. interpretation like that's the major in industry issue that i find at the moment is you've got like mm -hmm. Reality, perception, interpretation. Reality is what's actually happening. Perception is how you see it happening, and interpretation is how you feel about the thing that's happening. And my mm. sense is that, you know, in a world where we're completely washed over with messaging asynchronously from every single channel that exists on the planet right now, interpretation is the ultimate sort of default mechanism that humans immediately go to. Mm -hmm. It's crop brain, right? It's fight, flight, fright, or freeze. And if they interpret the message even slightly the wrong way in a sea of alternatives and in a sea of being bombarded by a lot of messaging, it's really yeah. easy for them to misinterpret and take it the wrong way. So I think that that's a, a real issue. And we, we talk about buyer a lot. You especially talk about buyer a lot. I think one of the paramount responsibilities that we have as a professional is buyer safety. So surely we have to get our messaging off on the right foot and making big assumptions around our research hypothesis for the individual that we're trying to prospect to. We shouldn't ever leave anything up to misinterpretation outside of the boundaries of professional business relevant communication, yeah. in my opinion. 
Yeah, and you know, and just and on that and on that buyer piece, I actually used the example the other day. I'm usually speaking about food or dating. I'm starting to see a pattern over the last two years. Anyway, so <laughs> it was about food, but I asked the audience of like 150 revenue leaders who's been to Nando's, and they were like, "Yep, been to Nando's. Like it's pretty standard." And I said, "What happens when you sit at your table?" They ask you one question: "Have you been to Nando's yeah. before?" And the answer to that question changes the whole experience. They're going to stand there and explain to you exactly what you need to do and what the process looks like and how you're going to engage with them. Or they're going to say, or they're going to say, cool, here's your 10 things. Go, go, go order. You know what you're doing. And the reason why is one, so they don't piss you off because they're like, I'm just going to create an experience based on your buying needs right now, which is you are informed and I'm just going to support you in getting what you need to get done. Now, if I've said that I've been to Nando's before and it's like, no problem. Okay, so what you need to do is like, I've been here, dude, I'm I'm, here, I'm with my friends now, like go out, we're not, we're going to get the court chicken yeah. and the extra wings on the side and the halloumi fries. Okay, like I'm good. But if there has been something changed, like post COVID, right, everything changed. Hey, so we actually have a limited menu. And so when it comes to buy safety, when it comes to really understanding where people are in their buyer journey, that's why, I, I emphasize it so much because we see it every day. And I think B2C still do this so well. You walk into a shop, yeah. how can I help you? They see you yeah. living around TVs. All of a sudden they're saying, what, what you know, what do you use your TV for? Is it just for work? Is it for entertainment, yeah. for gaming? Because that helps them to direct you. But we get into B2B and it gets all a bit, it's either so inappropriate or it's it's trying to be very specific. Like if I walked into Nando's and they're like, hi, Hannah. Mm. Oh, sorry. Like, I, w- I wouldn't be expecting that. Like, no. you expect a personalised experience when you've maybe paid premium or you're opting yeah, into Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I, if I go to a luxury hotel, that's what I want every time I come in and out of the hotel because that's essentially I'm paying for my ego to be furnished. But in a general day-to-day... And here's the other thing with outreach in particular, because that's my area of expertise, is really the top of the funnel stuff. Outreach is an ambush, right? You've always got to remember the psychological state of wherever you're inserting your message, it's, it's unexpected and it's a surprise. Now that has massive benefits, but if you do anything to set the tone wrong because you've been slightly outside the boundary or you've taken a big speculative bet that because it worked for somebody else, it's going to work for that person, you're in for a big surprise. Also, you can't test personalization. It's a myth. Mm-hmm. Like if you want to build really well-aligned scientific go-to-market motions, you know, marketing, success, sales, customer are all baked into this beautifully organic pie how can you test messaging if everyone's deviating from the messaging yeah. because they're adjusting the filters it might work on maybe one or two of your most high value accounts in tiny addressable markets where you're such an acute subject matter expert that the market's going to turn to you anyway yeah like semiconductors there's about 12 market participants in the GPUs. <laughs> right, exactly. There's one company that builds the manufacturing center for, 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 for semiconductors. They've got a $50 billion sales back order at the moment that they can't deliver. Their market cap's $20 billion. There's one of them. Yeah. Right? You're going to go to the CEO of that company. You better have an acute, specific, relevant message that also reflect on the fact that you can potentially impact him personally why he's got this 50 billion dollar back order of semiconductors that he needs to shift and there's a consequence world trade is locking up because of it yeah right people can't get cars at the moment people can't get stereos people can't get tvs so what's happening in his business has a massive consequence one of one tiny market you can be really well thought out researched almost feel like a hedge fund analyst in the way that you approach yeah, yeah. that dude <laughs> But you probably can do it in a sort of scalable point software solution, which is where most people operate, right? So, mm. so, so this is tough because I I am team relevance, and and there's a reason for that, and it's because I I've come up at a time where we yes, there's things that have changed, right? I appreciate people aren't at their desk and all those things, right? I get it, but I say team relevance because uh, it does take a lot of brain power to get to that what people are expecting from personalization and oftentimes unless you are and you mentioned something about tone and humor i think some people have a real natural flair like someone messaged me yesterday i said are you going to try and sell me something and they were like yeah well this is why because this is what we do and i was like why is it different and he was like don't worry i'll show you at this time and I said, he, he gave me a couple of examples actually and i was like oh, i didn't know you guys do that now and he said i'm going to book some time in for tuesday and i said no he said he, I said Thursday's better and he said ah no one likes Tuesdays anyway cool let's go for Thursday but I just like like that was quite natural to that individual so like with some people be like oh my god they said no Tuesday but he's like 
yeah, I don't like Tuesdays neither, let's go for it. So, but I don't, not everybody has that. So I think you are safer and it's easy to do the relevance piece. And I always say that relevance can also be owned by, at a company level. Yeah, yeah it's a strategy. There you go, right? So it's a strategy yeah. saying that these are going to be the macroeconomic pillars and things yeah. that are going to impact this group of individuals and companies. And we know that they have a high propensity to have a requirement or be open to discussion mm. because of these things. So it's like a business level thing rather than yeah. trusting a 21 year old out of school who's like, I worked at a bar for all of school to now really get into the strategy, strategy mindset and be an analyst to find the perfect prospect. So I am team relevant because I think I find it's more scalable. But so tell me, I'm a, I'm a rep or I'm a leader AI is being put on my agenda now and it's telling me go faster, do half my job. Every There's a new data provider every few weeks, it seems. There's so many out there. Um, someone's telling me I'd never use a dialer. That's crazy. It's so impersonal. I don't want to, you know, I'm not, I don't work in a call center. How do you balance all of those variables to come up with a reason why there should be, we should be focusing relevance? It's a big question. Yeah, because you can, you can scale and test messaging. Like that's the thing. If I can't test something, I don't know if it works. And people are doing so little in the form of productive, measurable, result-based work in sales development at the moment. Mm. That everything you see around email is a proxy measure, right? A reply, great. Did it lead to something? No, generally the majority of replies are an unsubscribe request. How do you measure for that? Yet it's still regarded as an ego metric. Volume versus inbox delivery. Like those are such sort of burning products problems for people today but they've lost touch with well, what's the point of being able to do anything at scale it so i can test learn iterate and refine which is what consumer marketing gets spectacularly right but guess what even in consumer marketing they still operate at like one to two percent conversion in b2b we're expecting people to operate at like superior like double digit conversion and it's not necessarily that realistic unless we're in such a defined market with massive product market fit that we can we can really soak up most of the market immediately without having to put, apply that effort and there are very yeah. few companies in the innovation economy that share those characteristics of immediately market dominant or category defined companies you know category defined in our world would be a crm like salesforce or hubspot they don't really need to do a lot of outbound but they still do a huge amount of outbound time yeah because their biggest competitor is still that company that sits on a excel file to, to run their entire business there are still billion dollar companies that do that yeah. yeah so so what do i want to get from my my relevance messaging well i want to be able to calibrate for it i want to be able to adjust my messaging to find out what the most consistent route to market is i want to be able to identify my channel preference does my prospect in my market live in email? Do they live in LinkedIn? Do they live in text message? Do they live in cold call? Do they live in, I don't know, swag drops or smoke rings? It doesn't really matter, but you know, that's, that's one of the key points. Relevance based messaging can get you there really fast because you can just repeat the messaging over and over and over and over and over again, provided it's aligned to a problem set and a list of people that you want to speak to. Yeah. And then also you're just removing the cognitive load from the rep. And I think this is one of the things that we've really distorted in, the good times, you know, when the macroeconomics were really good, we kind of ended up with a lot of Lord of the Flies type stuff where the reps were running the show, not the sales leadership. Sales to market strategy, Jerry, that's what I call it. Just yeah, sales. and it's it's not the right strategy, especially in funded startups that didn't necessarily have message market fit. And I said to one of my team today, I was like, mate, we live in a world right now where we've molly coddled junior sales reps for far too long. And I know that sounds controversial, but it's the truth. There are a lot of manifestations of their issues around job creativity and stuff. But actually, we now live in an economy and in a world where job creativity is not the job that they have to do. They just simply have to sit and execute. Mm. And the other reality that most people aren't willing to lean into, even though we talk about buyer process and buyer safety, it's still an unnatural job. It's a profession of discomfort. We're asking people to do unnatural things in order to make good things happen for people. And it's also sort of a similar issue that I sort of see bridging out in like how people parent today it's uh it's a culture dictates truth rather than truth dictating culture at times and you know we've gone a little bit too far i think in in prescribing the jobs that people need to do because we've been so reliant on saying to them well how do you think the jobs should be done and i think there's a massive imbalancing that's happening at the moment now good reps understand that their job is to find source select and optimize their time 
Mm. Bad reps like falling back on fairly lazy crutches. And research for me is a is a really lazy crutch. I could spend an hour, especially in an AI world, like three months ago, I could spend two hours reading a report, 401k, a, a stock market filing, an investor relations report. I'd then go around the universe of identifying who I need to go and prospect to. I can literally get that work done now with three or four really intelligent prompts in OpenAI. I can yep. get that to generate the, the, the email, which potentially scales for me. So what's my job? If I've got machinery that can do the cognitive work, because that was the only job I really had as a sales pro, it being cognitive. And now I think that we're going to see this massive shift, especially with a lot of the sort of email limitations that are falling in and around and clamping down on Yahoo and Google right now. Yeah. We'll see how that plays out. I'm not going to be a doom monger there or, or use it as a way to sort of really create FOMO for my business. But yeah. if it does oh, have the potential really. consequences, well, yeah. no, but it means that sellers have to return to being highly cognitive and highly emotionally intelligent rather than highly analytical and highly process oriented because they now need to adapt playbook and that's where their job should be. But their job shouldn't be to change messaging because messaging is the one thing that will help you find market dominance. Um, yeah. and that's the job of the CEO if a rep doesn't feel comfortable with that well so be it maybe it's not the right place for them to be and that yeah, sounds yeah. really brutal but you know I think that's just the nature of of where we have to be for at least 24 months well, while interest rates are still so high but you're you right to sell now yeah you do and and uh, I just wanted to bring up something you might have seen it floating about but I know at one of the SAS this, uh, this year Jason Lemkin was like it's not hard it's just what it should have been and what it's always been now like you yeah. said we, we had to get creative we had to run profitable businesses a decade ago like it wasn't a case of just yeah. like being out yeah, there burning yeah, yeah. cash he said we're just returning back to what yeah. it used to be and and you can see like the old school vets in the audience like see the new school was like what are, you what are you talking about this is this is really hard and it's true i think i do think you're right with even going, thinking about the topic that we we kind of shipped back the the, the creativity, the individuality of reps a lot over the last seven or eight years. And then we said, go figure it out. And then I like, but you've told me what to do for the majority of my career. Yeah. And now you're asking me to go do this deep research. And I haven't had to do that to, to understand messaging, to test this out. You're not giving me much and you want me to figure it all out, but it's hard. And then to, 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 to kind of add to that, comp compensation's gone through the roof. So everyone expects to come into a, a role at like, between 60 and 100k even if you are a bdr yeah. be like why, why am i not earning six figures like six figure hashtag six figure gap. You, you need you need to add value and i think the way that most people can add value right now isn't necessarily by being the most innovative in the business process it's being the most diligent in executing the process so that you can find where the fault lines in the process are mm. Like, that's what I really want. I want somebody that can come in and break the process, but execute the process comprehensively so that they can break the process so that it can be redesigned. Yeah. But I don't want somebody to come in and imagine that it's a feelings-based exercise to break the process. And I think the one big sea change that we're seeing at the moment is a lot of weak leaderships just hoping and waiting that they can return to the old playbook at the moment. And I'm sorry with the tech investment environment in the way that it is right now. And the general supply chain environment it is for categories that aren't software my sense is that we don't have that luxury i think 24 will see some rebound because what are the alternatives and then i think 25 will see yet another dip because markets will rationalize and normalize as the us election plays out now most people when they go to their job to set meetings for enterprise aes or for enterprise aes who go to work to close deals they're not yeah. thinking about that macro stuff but that to me is the relevant context that surrounds every single engagement you have with your customer. And those are the things that you need to be aware of because those are where your deal talk pre-runs are going to come from. And unless you can keep your messaging absolutely relevant, people aren't going to buy from you today just because they like you. They want to make sure that you're the validated vendor that can solve the business problem. Yeah. And actually you can be a bit of a dick as the salesperson providing you maintain value on the problem set that you can solve for. If you can't do that, you become irrelevant. And I think that, you know, we're probably gonna rebound a little bit to even harder edged salespeople again. You know, those people that aren't scared to have those big robust commercial conversations and turn around to the CEO of a company and say, you know what, you're a little bit wrong here. Why? Because the messaging was relevant throughout this program. And if you want this problem solved, this is the only way you're gonna get it done.
So yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of more of the unnatural acts moving forward. Yeah. Okay. And being um, more ruthless with, with pipeline and timing and, and, and disqualifying things like this. And this is, I, th- I think reps always wait until they get really senior before they become ruthless with their time. It takes a long time to build up that confidence to be like, I've got four deals. Those two are just, I, they're just not doing the things that I need them to do for me to actually invest time in it. And I, I, I feel like I'm doing a good job. So let me just hang on to them. But more, you get older and more mature and more yeah. tenured and you're like, nah, get out. I ain't wasting my time here. Right. So, yeah. Which is really yeah. interesting. I, I wanted yeah. to give some time to, I was going to respond to you, but I know there's a couple of questions that came up or some yeah. kind of uh, perspective. So Liam is saying, having been in tech investing for ABC and growth equity fund for the last four years, it's nice to see the econ- economy semi-normalized from a cash burning era. No, com- complete, I completely agree. I went from, I was saying to someone the other day, I, my first AI startup was in 2011. Like, what? Mm. Like, yeah. Yeah, right? too, by the way. You think it's hard? <laughs> we were selling a concept, right? Yeah. Where we were selling AI and we literally had a team in yeah, Kia, like this. We have a product. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Literally like little little aliens inside the machine, like yeah, trying yeah. to execute, not enough computing power to do it. And so yeah. literally only selling to our TAM at the time was like 200 companies globally. Um if they were hanging out, they would have been killing it now because of the, 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 the how the technology is evolving. <laughs> that's just that's just how it is. So yeah, I, I actually like that things are semi-normalizing yeah. because back then that just wasn't a thing, right? We we got paid on profit as a rep. You did not get paid on revenue. Like all these things are yeah. there's gonna be a good shift, but I think it's gonna be for for the better. Um so we've got Ross. Okay, so this is a long Great question. So Ross says, do you think results from outbound cold email messaging will come more from a combination of relevance and messaging and timing? Nice. Mm-hmm. Rather than personalization and messaging and timing. Intrigues me, especially in SaaS businesses on standing out without personalization in a saturated market. Or is it a result of the above, but with comprehensive A-B testing and accurate measuring? What I think, think it's relevance. I think it is relevance driving to standing out in the primary inbox if I'm using email as my channel for outbound. Mm-hmm. Um Justin Michael, who some of you may or may not know, but if not, I'm putting him on your radar. He's written three really interesting books over the past three years. The (laughs) fact that relevance is a game-changing, billion-dollar pipeline-busting competency. But it's also been realistic about the fact that you don't hit home run with each and every single one. But unless you are adapting your writing style to choppy, text-based, asynchronous messaging versus prose-based email, you're going to fail. If you're Mm. not showing results immediately, if you're not writing messages to your prospects as if they were like your mum, your best friend, or you know somebody that you're arranging to meet to pick up a, I don't know, pram or a cot that you're selling on, you know, whatever marketplace it is that you're doing that. But it has to kind of feel that way because it's more organic and it's a pattern interrupt. Timing is a is an issue, right? Think about this: everybody's looking for in market opportunities, but only three percent of people are in market in any quarter. Fact, Chet Holmes, study Chet Holmes and and the way that he's built market dominance theory, which means that you can still go outbound to your entire market, but actually drop what it is that the objective is aligned to. Are you trying to get meetings? Are you trying to gain proprietary information that enables you to really hit scale in the next two, three quarters by finding out earlier who's in market in the next quarter? My sense is if you're finding out who's in market right now, you've already lost the deal because they've already done their research. They're already speaking to other vendors. But use yep. your outbound to calibrate your timing. And I think that comes on to Liam's question, which is straight under Ross's, which yeah, is yeah. competitive markets. As somebody from an investment context, Liam, you'll know that there are two things that really matter in, in a down market where you know capital isn't cheap anymore. Speed is the ultimate point of competitive difference can i execute faster than anybody else right how do i stay relevant i speak to more people faster than anybody else simply can right and i've got examples the one real success story in my career was a buyout it was in the hr tech industry private equity i was at conferences with major vendors like workday and sap around me going how is this little 11 person company in so many of our deals, speed, we just cared about velocity. Mm. Like we probably neglected equality a little bit and that's my shameful confession from my career. But I tell you what, speed powered by relevance, powered by the right force multipliers, you can do a huge amount. And the, the analogy that I'll always use here is it's like military, it's a bit macho and I apologize for that. But special forces are seen as strategic assets. 
they've got elite people sat in seats equipped with enablement training resources that normal soldiers simply don't have so that's probably how i'm thinking about my team set up in that congested market i want to go speed 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 i think intent signals are useful but again they're good at finding the the in-market opportunities, the stuff that I can hoover up today. But if I actually want to build market dominance, which is surely the objective of a company in a competitive category, I need to be finding intent. And the only way I can get intent is to actually be in conversation with the market to find out when they're thinking about buying the thing. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm flogging. And I can't do that through six cents, Zoom Info, Bombora. They're just going to tell me who's sniffing around my product today. And, and that doesn't really help me unless all my strategy is reliant upon is hoovering up soft demand. But I can't yeah. build a market dominant company on soft demand. I, I was going to say to Liam's question, I, I always think about it in in how you get someone to look at a problem or a challenge or an opportunity in, di in a different way. I know it's it's not so much challenger, but it's a case of when you're when everyone's coming at you with the same thing. It's a bit like, yeah, I know. Like I, I, I mean, I sold data for half my career. Every, like you've got the zoom info cognizance, all that. Yeah. It, I found it so easy. The reason why is because I always thought about. So firstly, I didn't oversell anything. I was like, it's all the same. However, <laughs> right? But the way it was approached it is like, get people to think about different use cases, get people to think about different applications and really understand where you differ. Like you, you have to, when you have a, situ a, a solution that is samey, samey, right? Like product parity right now is insane. Like you, you, you're gonna be the differentiator. So firstly, I'd step in as, a tr as the trustworthy person because all my other peers at the competitive companies who are bigger, more aggressive and fancy of all their tech and their tools, would just be dishonest. They wouldn't follow up. They would talk about how great everything is. They don't have, they don't have any issues with yeah. errors in data. I just keep it real, 100% real, absolutely transparent. Manager hated it because I was way too honest, but I just helped them look at the data in a different way. So I would often sell in my solution mm -hmm. and they have the same thing, but they're like, well, it, that doesn't do this. So I always say, if you're selling in a solution that's very samey, just think about whether that solution has solved the whole problem. And it often hasn't. Uh, it kind of gets us to 80% of the way. If there's a 20% gap, you'll be surprised at if there is enough value there, they will spend again. I know people talk about tech consolidation, all this stuff, but if I had, if Jerry had a tool right now, but there was something that it wasn't doing enough of, like maybe you had a personal trainer, there was a little gap and I'm like, yeah, but can they help you deadlift 10X in the next, you know, get your personal best? Yeah. No, we don't work on that. That's important to you. I can get in. So you'll be very surprised at identifying that little gap and how much value is in there. But again, you've got to get better at asking questions. And the framework that I always uh, share with my reps is um, issues, challenges, and opportunities. So really quickly, issues are things that people are already looking to solve because they are things that are fundamentally broken inside their processes and their business. They're already out there. They're running, they're, that, that's the sixth sense data. That's the demand, demand base and all those tools. Challenges are things that people learn to live with, right? Right now, I've got a challenge. My lights in here aren't great. Someone came to me and changed my perspective. I'd probably change them. No one's selling to me. So people learn to live with these challenges. Mm. I talk about my mobile phone charger. It's broken, been broken for two years, but it works just enough, right? When it breaks, it's an issue. Opportunities are things that usually get pushed down the line because I haven't felt the gain. It sounds great. Sounds great to be able to 10x my, you know, deadlift and all that crap. But mm, I'm all right. Still quite fit. It's, it's, it doesn't mean anything to me until I'm doing yeah. CrossFit. So you have to really, you, you've got to figure out like the prospects that you're going after. How do I shift yeah. after that challenge? That challenge. <laughs> And to live with and, and get them to take action i mean so, it's, it's the old adage right like a, a similar experience in that framework recently i'm changing cars at the moment um you know similar yeah. dealership <laughs> network similar similar brand same umbrella co company i looked at two different cars in two different dealerships rep a oh do you like the you know the upholstery and the size yeah great rep b can you tell me a little bit about your life mr how much driving do you do yeah how many kids have you got What's your lifestyle like? Where do you go? You know, for those who can't see me, I'm quite big. I'm like six foot six and 130 kilos. So, you know, I need, I, I'm not getting in a Ferrari, right? So it's, it's these kind of questions that actually are relevant, but they draw mm. you to competency and competency is one of the most important laws of attraction ever in the, in the psychological framework, how you interact with people that, that laws of attraction. But laws of attraction isn't necessarily this this false curiosity, you know, and you can smell inauthentic people from yeah. far off. 
relevance doesn't really require you to be an authentic it requires you to be highly credible because you have to go deeper you have to be more expert than those initial little sachets of value that you're able to get out into the world and kind of predicate for you you know I love it's that. not the full portion right i love that i just want to say same situation with a car actually my my guy who's been helping me is like so the, that opportunity thing, he's like, honey, you don't need that. Based on what you told me, you don't even drive that often. It's going to be sitting on your drive a lot. Yeah. You're not doing massive distances. Don't waste your money. This is what you need. Still still yeah. a bit luxury, but, and I was like, thank you for saving me some money. So going through the same process sounds all exciting, but bringing me back down to that reality check. Yeah. And, I, and I loved it. Did yeah, Liam, I th sorry, Liam, follow up to really clever question. I hope you don't mind me taking that one, Hannah, but it's... Yeah, we just quickly... Uh, yeah, I... I, I, I I think Brian does have a, a story to play, but you're seeing market participants in revenue tech at the moment get absolutely smashed because they haven't kept up with the change in the market fast enough. You know, if you look at sales loft, for example, they got bought at the top of the market by Vista, who don't typically make bad bets, but they modeled their entire investment on compound annual growth rate based on sales hiring numbers <laughs> and seat licenses going up on this continual hockey stick. I'd argue they've got a good brand but their product at the moment sucks and they've got material problems with net present value so great brand great energy but where's their leadership team it's not in seat today private equity what's it doing with that investment it's probably a little bit annoyed that it made the investment cognizant great brand but i can tell you as a customer and somebody that's known for being an expert on contact data Quality is no different to any one of the other vendors in the market. They've just got a really compelling story that they built GDPR mm -hmm. first and weren't scared to to, to market themselves and, and invest in brands. Mm -hmm. James took big bets with that money, invested in events, and he went into a, a sort of culture battle, which was, I'm going to treat my staff better than anyone else's, and that was his brand. But in terms of product quality, it's non-differentiated to anybody else's product in that category. Yeah. So, you know, that helps them, but how that market plays out, who knows? For me, it's about speed. Can Cognizant's rep get into more yeah. conversations at the top of the funnel than anybody else in order to sustain that momentum? And that's actually the real question is momentum is king yeah. in down markets. And it's about finding ways to maintain the momentum. And at some point, somebody on James's board is probably going to say to him, look, your marketing spends a little bit out of control for the quality of earnings that you're getting right now. Or what are you going to do about it? And he might have to pull some of those brand investments and then they might start to peter off into irrelevance if their reps can't maintain the momentum that the brand exercises have driven forward for them. So, you know, I think it's a delicate balancing act. Yeah, good point there. Because I think that momentum, just going back to that, everyone, because you will get, who th think of brands where you're like, where have they gone? And then you're like, yeah. oh, they are still here. The momentum's gone. The, the, the investment in what you... The expectation you now have of that brand, the expectation hasn't been met because you're like, oh, you are always here and you're showing up here and I got lots of campaign from you and I saw you at these events. And then you hear companies saying we're no longer investing in that. That does often have a direct impact on that follow through, which is people, you know, having those connections from, from reps and driving new pipeline because they're like, oh, I didn't even know you guys were still around. But I had this this new company hitting me up every minute so I just thought they were they were the new the new kids in town but I wanted to get to Mohammed uh, before we close off so I'm a 21 year old freelancer and started my career a year ago as a as a designer and have a small team for can you put a light on how you can begin to get into a cycle of generating more business and what the goal should be to expand my business so first things first I work with uh, Mohammed and his team they're incredible momentum execution straight up awesome so if you if you need anything around UX and design work please go and hit them up so one thing I will say is that uh, when, in my opinion, when you first start out, I think you should execution should be the main focus. You, you actually just have to deliver on your promise. I actually put a video out around um, expanding revenue. And the more you deliver on your promise, the more you can make and the more you get testimonials, the more people shout and scream about it. You can create a product. It's not like what uh, <laughs> I know that you were delivering when you were going up against Workday and those. You said maybe not in the, uh, the the process, but you delivered. That's why people were like, oh, OK, these, you know, these guys are doing what they're, they're saying got to do. But the momentum and delivery is going to be, for me, that's going to be the game changer. So at this stage, don't take on too much and produce a poor product because then you're like, your customers will sell will, will, will sell it for you in the most case in that part. I, I'd, I'd, I'd make it a slightly more tactical exercise as well, Mohammed. I'd write a list. Who, who can I serve by company type 
and who in those companies can I speak to about my offering? And what am I going to say to them when I speak to them that applies to a problem that I can solve? And then I'd take a first pass of that list. I'd show it to my CEO and I'd go, do you agree with this? And I'd ask him or her to contribute to that list significantly, refine it and narrow it down so that you become an expert around those five companies and those 15 people and the 15 messages that you need to get into the market with them all being relevant. And it's that exercise of boiling down from big to small that generally makes you elite at business development. I think when you stay up in the, yeah. I've got a time of a thousand, you never get anything done. Yeah. yeah, it's too hard. It's too difficult. You're spoiled by volume and you think, okay, it's just a numbers game. I work in a high velocity world or I sell velocity, but one of the things that we're always telling our customers to do is actually just keep making every list a subsection of the next list and the next list and the next list. Why? So that you can be as relevant and as useful to your prospect as possible. Yeah. So don't think big, think small, narrow the list, narrow the list to the people that you are most likely to serve. And here are the three questions that I would ask myself. Can I serve them? in a profitable way where they benefit from everything I have to give them. And I still make money off the deal. The next thing I say, well, what would I say to them about why we're going to be useful to them? And I look at that in two very simplistic ways. First one is I walk into Starbucks. I see my old best friend from school as personal trainer knows nothing about business or what I do for a living. How would I explain my job to him? And then the second exercise would be I walk into a coffee shop that afternoon and I see my next best customer on that list and they start telling me all of their problems that they have at work that day. And I start to build my messaging up around those, those two smaller gems. exercises. Yeah. These are gems. These are gems. I love that. I always talk about and that's the, how you build relevant. That's how you build relevant messaging. Cause yeah. guess what? If you've got a CEO at company X, the CEO at company Y, probably suffers from exceptionally similar challenges, just in slightly different packaging. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. So, similar challenges, different, different packaging. So, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm an organization. I, we, we, we get it. We're like, you know what, this personalization thing is hard for us. We're not getting the, the first thing we're not getting the volume out and we're not getting the responses that we we're hoping for. So how do we start to transition to, to relevance? What's like the, the one to three things we should be looking at to say, okay, by next week, we're on it. That's a yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, really. It's, it's an interesting one. There's always this delicate tension, right? And there's always a reason not to press send on the email or not to pick up the phone and make the cold call. And it's a human condition, which is we're waiting for perfection. Perfection doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, especially in the mind, mind's eye of a complete stranger. Hugely important to remember that each and every single one of these people are strangers. They don't know you. At all. <laughs> Ever. Yeah, maybe never they will. Maybe they never will. And you've got to be comfortable yeah. with that. Yeah. I, no, that's that's a that's a good call out. I think I think for me, making that transition is is really the company, what you said, the CEO and the 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 C suite, all of the 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 VPs of should really be thinking about how do wh where's our most relevant space, right? So yes, we can sell to everyone. We have a tool that has data, that's great. But who wh where where's where do we think people are most open? And how do we create a re relevant set of messages that we can use to target? And we should not be putting that on the reps because it's really not their job to figure out our strategy. So that's Definitely. kind of, that's, that's where to start. So really quickly, I know we've gone over uh, Queen. So um, talking about objections, um, can you recount a personal experience where you effectively addressed a customer's concern? I feel like I'm in an interview. <laughs> and what right. specific yeah, strategy yeah. did you personally employ? Let me get out my, is it star, the star method? <laughs> what was the situation? Oh, that's one thing. That's one thing. I, I think if you try and sort of pre-plan for this stuff a little bit, you can come across as a little bit unnatural. So in cold call, we we coach or I coach the, the, the cliff edge, which is buy yourself time to think about the actual nature of the question. So let's say, for example, Hannah said something to me that sort of rocked me in my heels a bit with an objection that I'm not prepared for. I take time, I breathe, and I go, fantastic, and lean into it as if it's the most natural thing in the world to be about to expect this and, in fact, embrace it and enjoy it. Mm. Now, objections are actually coming from an interesting place psychologically, and it's important to understand a little bit of this, which is... In an ambush, in a cold call or a cold email environment, people just want to get out of their conversation with the dignity intact. So what do they want to do in order to do that? They want to categorize us. So if we're using marketing language or product language or category language or technical language, super easy for somebody to turn around and ask you a technical question 
almost bait you into an answer and go, ah, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Right. <laughs> so, so I always look at objections as opportunities to redirect because I never use cold, cold outreach as an opportunity to qualify. That's what the first meeting's for. Mm. If you're in my list, you're inherently qualified. So there's reason for you and me to be speaking right now in the Thank ambush. That, what do I want to do with the objection? I want to turn it back into a customer story or a redirect. So fantastic. Glad you asked. Now's not an appropriate forum to have that conversation. Because like I said, I only asked for half a minute of your time and I think I've gone over. But given your interest, maybe it would be beneficial for you to hear about Burned over at Lacework. He was suffering from a really similar problem to the one that I described earlier. And within 12 months, he was ROI positive of, to the tune of $25 million with no technology transformation required and minimal change management to their sales process. And the reason for my call was just simply to see whether 20 minutes on our calendar to share this breakthrough would be useful to you. I'm, I'm a morning person. How's Tuesday at 8.30 look? I'm happy to Because I've only got one objective. I just want to see if I can get more time with that human. I don't want yeah. to sell my product or service in that first conversation or something. Yeah. Just but if you can show a bit of social proof, turn it back at them, say this isn't the forum because I don't have much of your attention because you don't, you've ambushed them. You've mm -hmm. got about three and a half percent of somebody's mind at that moment. Why would I want to put myself in a situation where I get baited into giving them an excuse to exit the conversation. I've got them there. It's valuable real estate. I'm going to do the best I can to keep them, but I'm going to do it with customer value, customer stories, and deliberately stay as vague as I possibly can. Yeah. And when you can feel, and some people, you can tell, some people just sit, try and get you off the phone. Some people are trying yeah. to bait you. Some people are like, they've got really genuine concerns. Like, I don't, I just don't feel like, um, you know, that stacks up to our priorities right now. And you can, you yeah. can use methods like Lair to say, when you say priorities and you, you said that there's a, a few things stacking up, uh, you know, we're, we know that people are focusing on this right now and you can explore it further because sometimes people need to unravel. I always say sometimes if people are giving you their time as a reason for that, that's metadata. Mm -hmm. So I'd say they're talking to me. You know what? They, they give me something here. They, they actually just need someone to talk to. <laughs> so let them talk yeah. and then give them, transition them into a, a space where you can get, you know, get time yeah, to follow exactly. research, et cetera. Yeah. But listen, it's, it's me and Jerry, right? We, we can, there's another hour or two in us. This is what happens. But this has been, this has been <laughs> yeah, right. really, really wicked topic. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, most of you stayed. You're obviously not working hard enough, right? <laughs> I kid, yeah. I kid. Good to see you, Liam. Yes. <laughs> Oh, wicked. Uh, we'll be back again next week with, um, I think Wesleyan's going to be joining me to talk more about leadership and how we can help support people throughout the buyer journey as leaders. So thank you again, everyone. There was a link that we shared earlier on. If you wanted to do a quick go-to-market assessment, click on that. It's like X amount of questions. It takes about five minutes, but you do get a really deep dive into, uh, into things that you can do. Jerry, is it a LinkedIn follow? Is it email? What do you prefer? <laughs> cold call? Well, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I didn't make some important list last week, so I was a bit jaded for a few days. But <laughs> no, call me. I will give out my phone number. Anyone can call me at any time. 07702-034081. I field probably about six good cold calls a year, but I'm here to help. So if anybody's got any questions, want to dig, dive, dig, dig a bit deeper, got some career questions that they've got, Shout out to Elliot Bowl over at MedPick Academy who got me in the bath at 6.30 in the morning once after doing a webinar like this. And we've become firm friends ever since. And he's a super kid. That. So yeah, I'm more than happy to field, field calls from people. Amazing. No, I appreciate you, Jerry. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. wisdom. Can I give you that title, The Buster Rhymes of Cold Calling? Because you you hit us with the, uh, don't the lyrics. Matty Dredd, uh, know, he's bald now, man. He's bald. Has he gone bald now? I thought he had, but I'm thinking you hit about us the right lyrics. he's trying. I'm thinking Buster Rhymes and he's trying. No, no, no. New school Buster Rhymes. The trim one with the, with the bald head. <laughs> I'm <laughs> in. No, I'm in. Appreciate you, all. appreciate you all. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it so Thank much. You. No See worries. ya.